Hello, I'm Richard Hara, and this is Social Impact Live, a weekly conversation with members of the Columbia School of Social Work community. Due to recent developments, our program today is focusing on COVID-19, the public reaction and stigmatization with our guest, Alyssa Davis, who is an assistant professor at the Columbia School of Social Work and an epidemiologist by training. Alyssa, welcome to Social Impact Live. Thank you for having me. Um, epidemiologist. It's very <laughs> fortuitous um, to have you on our faculty, not just because of mm -hmm. that, but just to demonstrate that social work um, encompasses many different yeah. disciplines and, and people with different backgrounds. So I'm just yeah. curious to hear a little bit um, about your background in epidemiology and maybe your pathway to social work. Yeah, so I, earlier during my master's degree, had worked with a nonprofit organization in Russia working with street kids and human trafficking victims, and I became very interested in public health and kind of looking at some of these issues more at a population level, and so pursued a degree in epidemiology and was mostly focused on uh, doing research around HIV and sexually transmitted infections um, with some uh, tuberculosis work. Uh, and then I came here to Columbia University and did my postdoc at the HIV Center, mm. uh, but was fortunate to be able to work here with Nabil El Basel, uh, Louisa Gilbert, Elwin Wu, and other researchers here at the Social Intervention Group because mm -hmm. I was particularly interested in the work they were doing around interventions on HIV and STIs and, and how to address some of these issues. Um, I think epidemiology is very interesting in, in characterizing diseases, but I was really interested in the social work focus on social justice issues mm. and how to create interventions that could help alleviate some of the burden and health inequities um, among marginalized populations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I, so you've got a background. You've uh, studied, uh, researched, and been involved with programs. Uh, for intervention regarding infectious disease um, in mm -hmm. the past. So just curious, um, looking at things now um, with regard to uh, COVID-19, and what, what's your general impression? I mean, is this kind of what we've always seen with epidemics and pandemics in the mm -hmm. past, or is there something novel, new about this? I mean, I think unfortunately it is the case that with epidemics, particularly new epidemics, we tend to see a lot of fear, which fuels um, a lot of blame and shame against other populations that we might view as other than us. So for example, with HIV, initially there was a lot of blame placed on Haitians because uh, we viewed that they were the ones who brought HIV. Mm. Um, you know, you've seen with SARS, there was also a lot of blame placed on Asian, Asian populations mm -hmm. and immigrants with um, swine flu, Mexican Americans or Mexican immigrants mm. were also stigmatized and blamed with Ebola. Then you have Africans who are receiving additional stigma and discrimination. So I think, unfortunately, these pre-existing prejudices that we have as a society tend to show themselves even more in times of fear. Um, so in that regard, I don't think, unfortunately, the stigma that we are seeing now against um, particularly Asian populations mm -hmm. is necessarily new. Mm. Yeah, I'm, I'm just thinking about uh, mm -hmm. epidemics and, and, and sort of how they're associated with immigrant populations or mm -hmm. the other, so to speak, yeah. and so on. And I'm just wondering um, how far back that goes, or is that just a, maybe a, a product of globalization and maybe modern society and the ease with which we can travel from place to place? I, I think it makes it a little bit more scary with globalization now mm -hmm. that it is easier to travel, but I think we have a very long history of, of policing blame on, on other populations. Mm -hmm. So back to the plague, you see the Europeans blame Jews for, mm. for bringing the plague and right. poisoning the wells. Um, yeah. And you have, you know, during medieval times, people would block off uh, cities when plagues were there trying to keep people out. And, and sometimes 
you know, it's you can use it to really try to stop the epidemic. But I think there's potential for oppressive governments or governments in general to use these situations as an opportunity to discriminate against other people and to further oppress um, other marginalized populations. So maybe there are particular races you don't want that you could keep from coming into your city or particular people with religious ideologies that you can prevent from, from coming into your city. So this, unfortunately, I don't think is new just because of globalization, although I think globalization makes makes epidemics more difficult to contain, mm -hmm. um, which further stokes fear in mm. people. Yeah, and and so, uh, well, before I turn to my next question, <laughs> I just want to remind our viewers that we do reserve the last 10 minutes for question and answer. So if you've got some questions that you'd like to ask Dr. Davis, please uh, write them in and we'll get them up on the screen um, uh, to answer uh, towards the end of the program. So just a reminder. Um, so is there a trajectory, I mean, for epidemics, is there always this initial period of we don't know what this is, we, we you know, we're all, and we have to find out who's responsible, is that kind yeah, of standard? Yeah, I think usually when epidemics um, first come, yeah. or at least with a lot of the more recent cases, so yeah. this novel coronavirus with SARS, with MERS, mm -hmm. Um, it's often transferred from an animal reservoir and, and we don't really know a lot about it. And so the CDC has the Epidemic Intelligence Service, the WHO has people, there are other public health agencies in other countries who have people who are really researching where this virus is coming from, how is it being spread, mm -hmm. what is the um, mortality or fatality rate. Um, mm -hmm. And so... Yeah, uh, you... Uh mentioned SARS and understand that uh, uh, during the SARS epidemic that you were in China or you were doing research or involved with something, so a project there? I was not in China during the SARS epidemic. Oh. I lived in Guangzhou, mm. um, which was the epicenter of the SARS epidemic in 2003, but I lived in Guangzhou in, in 2014 and was doing dissertation research there okay. among um, African women who were sex trafficking victims for the most part. And for those who don't know, Guangzhou has mm. the largest uh, African population in all of Asia. Wow. And in 2014, the Ebola outbreak happened in parts of Africa and the local government became very concerned that you know migrants coming into Guangzhou may bring the virus with them mm -hmm. um, may be transmitted to African sex workers who are also not only sleeping with African men but also sleeping with with Chinese men um, and so we actually ended up not being able to finish that research project because the government started arresting uh, sex workers. And yeah. and so I lost contact with many of the women that I had been working with. I don't know if, if they were arrested or if they just went into hiding so that they wouldn't be arrested. Um, but it shows that these types of fear situations um, in epidemics are, are common and unfortunately kind of a, a universal problem. And I understand for, you know, a city that had experienced SARS, why would they, they would be afraid and why they would be worried. Um, but that doesn't change the fact that, that some of these policies still um, impact minority populations and oppressed populations. Sure, sure. Yeah. Um, I, you know, and I'm not sure, since the situation is still evolving, mm -hmm. um, what represents best practices, right, with regard to containing an outbreak yeah. uh, and keeping it from uh, reaching the level of a pandemic. And, and I'm just curious your thoughts about, about China's uh, response uh, to coronavirus. And, and it seems that they've been successful insofar as they've been able to uh, reduce that rate or the, the number of new cases now um, to a very low number. Um, yeah, so I think that's the positive, is that they have been able to reduce cases. Mm -hmm. I think there are downsides to quarantines, including um, ability to access resources, so people may not be able to get all the supplies that they need or all the food that they need. Um, access to medical care um, can be limited in some cases. and. 
also just the psychological effects of, of being in quarantine for extended periods of time and having movements restricted can also be very difficult to handle. And there, there was an article that came out in The Lancet very recently talking about kind of the psychological effects of long-term quarantine and the need to be very cautious when, mm. when having, placing these, these measures yeah. into effect. Yeah. yeah. Well, it, but this is not only China now. Italy no. is on lockdown, yeah. right? And I'm just yeah. imagining what, um, you know, what that situation is going to look like. Yeah. Yeah. And quarantine, I think, in some instances is the right call and be, can be helpful mm. in slowing the epidemic. The U.S. so far seems to have imposed mostly voluntary quarantine where people are self-isolating at home right. other than the cruise ships. But, but I mean, closing organizations also has downsides as well. So in the New York Times, there's an article recently talking about New York City public schools mm. and why they're keeping them open because they serve as a safety net for many um, poor kids, yeah. you know, in the city who otherwise wouldn't have access to it, meals essential necessarily services. and essential yeah. services. But yeah. at the same time, you've got kids in the public school system who are saying, well, why are all the uh, kids in, in private schools, right, um, yeah. staying at home and not being exposed, you know, or are they somehow more special or, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a mixed message. Yeah, it, it is a mixed message. And I think there are also other instances where, you know, schools have been closed, but then kids get bored. They still find places to meet. So mm -hmm. it's not necessarily always an effective method of containment yeah. um, as well. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, what, what would be a reasonable response? I mean, how do you balance kind of the individual the rights of the individual versus, you know, the 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 um, the health of the community. I mean, that's a great <clears throat> question, and I don't think there's uh, like a one size fits all mm -hmm. answer. I think the public response should, to the extent possible, um, you know, limit personal freedoms as little as possible, while also maximizing protection of the community, but also taking into account how these um, public health responses impact members of different communities. Mm -hmm. And we need to be cautious that the public health responses we're implementing do not disproportionately impact marginalized populations yeah. or, or serve to further oppress uh, marginalized yeah, populations. I, I heard a commentator on TV say, say that, well, you know, maybe it's better for us to just simply, instead of worrying about everybody getting you know, mm -hmm. COVID-19 that, um, what we need to do is is protect the most vulnerable, right? People mm -hmm. over a certain age with other. So let's let's put them kind of somewhere where they'll be safe. And I know the intent is is is, is probably good, but um, what are the implications of of taking people and then segregating yeah, them? Yeah, like I think yeah. there's potential for a lot of stigma that way. There's also potential for a lot of upset and psychological damage if mm. people are being removed from families mm. or social supports, um, particularly elderly populations who may often feel socially isolated to begin with, mm -hmm. um, that could be very damaging. But I do think for people who are more vulnerable to contracting COVID-19, mm. uh, like elderly populations, you know, the CDC has issued guidance to stay home, try to limit uh, your exposure to public places or crowded places right. as much as possible. Um, you know, don't travel if you have an underlying health condition or, or you're elderly and more susceptible to picking up COVID-19 or, or at least mm. having more serious uh, outcomes from COVID-19 if you mm. do contract the illness. So I think trying to avoid panic, even though I know everyone is, is afraid, um, is and practice more, I guess, scientifically evidence-based responses to to the intervention rather, or to the epidemic rather than uh, immediately resulting to kind of more draconian measures mm -hmm. is, yeah, is a better way to go. Yeah, but I, in this age of social media and so on, and yeah. the way, I mean, literally things, turn viral and misinformation can be disseminated yeah. so easily. Um, and we've got 
literally, if not panic in the streets, panics in panic in the supermarket aisles. Yeah. Um, you know, buying and so on and, and things like that. So um, again, is this is this kind of the the irresistible momentum of these kinds of epidemics, or is there anything we can do to sort of to yeah. forestall the worst worst uh, effects of that? I mean, addressing misinformation, I think, is a major challenge in this day and age, not mm -hmm. just for epidemics, but just for other all issues in general. Yeah. Um, and how exactly you address that, I, I don't know. I don't have an answer to that. I wish I did. Mm -hmm. um, but I think trying to be informed, but not getting caught up in the fear mm -hmm. of, of everything that's going on. So I don't watch news shows where they just go on and on talking with moderators right. and stoking up these emotions of fear. I read news articles to see what's going on and what the situation is. But I think a good rule of thumb is try to be informed, but try not to become obsessed with all of the emotion and fear that, that some media outlets are, are trying to provoke among, among this. Yeah. So, so um, what source would you suggest um, for reliable information and so on um, for, for people? I, I mean, I think there are a lot of sources. I first and foremost would check the CDC's website and the WHO's website mm -hmm. because they're the ones who are working um, on these issues most closely and that's mm -hmm. where you will get uh, scientific evidence about their recommendations. I personally like to read the New York Times, I read NPR, mm -hmm. I read BBC. Um, but trying to avoid news outlets that that try to prey off of people's emotions right. and and really um, exaggerate things is is best. Yeah, yeah. I mean, generally speaking, <laughs> it's it's not a good idea to be plugged in twenty four seven to right. CNN for every breaking exactly. development, right? Exactly, and, and and to become obsessed with that. Exactly. So, um, so yeah, I, but we are living in an information age and we want to know uh, certainly what's going on what's it and there are so many questions right around yeah. COVID-19 we don't and and some of it maybe is because we feel like we haven't been getting full information and that's not necessarily uh, a, uh, maybe that's a governmental problem or and so on so um, in the absence of that kind of information. I mean, people are going to speculate and people are going to sort of imagine the worst case scenarios, mm -hmm. which they do. But it, it's interesting to me that uh, people are having this panic over COVID-19. But at the same time, we have, you know, seasonal flu that goes around and people right. still aren't getting their flu vaccine yet. We've already had 18,000 people die of flu this mm -hmm. year. Um, and I think some of that has to do with media portrayal. And right. if, if the reporting on every death from just seasonal flu were reported this similarly to deaths from COVID-19, mm -hmm. perhaps people would be in more of a panic about the flu. But I think that's just become an illness that's, that's so routine mm -hmm. that we have a tendency to just forget about it and that, that it also um, kills people. Yeah. But we do have a vaccine. There are treatments yeah. for the flu. And uh, because of that, maybe people have a, more of a sense of security, yeah. right? Um, and, and aren't uh, being pushed by panic as much as they are by COVID-19, at least at this point. Yeah. Um, looking down the line, do you kind of see things settling down? Um, I mean, I guess mm -hmm. the worst case scenario in everybody's minds is is is, is some kind of hollywood right yeah. kind of, um, uh, you know vision right. of, uh, of of things getting worse yeah. um but uh, um i mean what would be the normal course for uh, something like this based on recent experience yeah so i mean i do think more people will become infected i mm. think it it will be difficult to contain but i think as um other infectious disease experts who do a lot of research in this area have said uh, most cases are actually mild. Most people right. who contract COVID-19 won't see a lot of symptoms. Um, and so hopefully uh, with time, cases will become less and less. Mm -hmm. I think 
people have said it's still too early to tell whether cases will go down with weather changes like for the flu and, and other infectious diseases. But I personally am not worried about COVID-19 mm -hmm. becoming like an apocalyptic scenario. Mm -hmm. um, I think people need to, you know, be cautious and take normal precautions like you would for the, to prevent against the flu, but try not to become panicked over the situation. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, well, we have some questions. Let me, I can check to see. Um, could you suggest two small strategies for an Asian population to cope with the COVID-19 blame and shame? I'm currently working with this stigma with crew members worldwide being blamed and shamed on cruise ships as well uh, as other maritime sectors. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's very unfortunate. Um, uh, ways to cope with it. I, I feel like it's very difficult to change stigma among the broader community. So you can try to relay, um, you know, accurate information. But I think finding support groups and finding maybe a counselor to talk to or or other people who are supportive of you and who aren't blaming you can be really helpful mm -hmm. when when society around you is is actively discriminating against you or stigmatizing yeah. you. Yeah, and yeah. I think it's important for people to understand um, why they're being scapegoated, right? Yeah. I mean, often it's not really on account of right. the disease it's, because, you know, society has its fractures, right? Its mm -hmm. tensions and so on. And I think oftentimes um, when something like this comes up, it's an opportunity for people to sort of take all of that and sort of displace it onto a certain group yes. of people, right? Yes. Um, and which kind of allows us then to, to really maybe address the underlying uh, um, uh, problems within a, a society. Right? Yes. And I know that yeah. there are certain cases uh, from history with regard to epidemics and so on, where um, they have served as a clarion call for, um, you know, human rights and so on. Mm -hmm. and, and I think you hear some of that in, in, in some of the news reports out of China, yes. uh, where um, people are trying to get uh, accurate information out there. And mm -hmm. uh, um, yes, and, and it's an ongoing um, controversy, right, yeah. um, for people and, and their rights and, uh, and for human rights as well. Yes. So um, not that I would try to put a positive spin on epidemics or things like that, but we have, I think, um, um, many things going yeah. on there. Yeah. But I, I think you raise a good point, and it's something we should be prepared for, because this, is, this won't be the last epidemic. These will keep occurring in the mm -hmm. future, and every time there is one, we see a specific population blamed or marginalized. So I think thinking about ways for how to address these issues and how to address stigma and discrimination that arise in context of, of epidemics is important um, for the future. Yeah, and we yeah. just have to just uh, bring it up and, and call it for what it is and, mm -hmm. uh, and really sort of look at exactly what the hidden assumptions are yeah. and, and how accurate they are. Um, do you get the sense that this is a learning moment for public health in the U.S.? Are efforts being made to be more prepared? And are people more aware of stigma than they were before? I think we are getting better and better at our responses to the epidemics. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of stigma, I don't know if we're learning as well in terms of how we respond to stigma. Mm -hmm. I hope so. I think people are becoming more aware of the issues, but but yet we still see, you know, stigma and incidences of racism mm -hmm. happening, unfortunately. Um, but I hope that we do take it as an opportunity to think about ways we might cut down on so some of this behavior or ways that we might convey information differently so that people are not so prone to, to jumping to this fear response right away. Yeah. 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 But I mean, judging from uh, how people reacted to HIV AIDS and so on. I mean, it's taken us decades, right? Yeah, to and get there's to this still point. a lot of stigma <laughs> around HIV AIDS. Yeah. So, so I'm not hopeful, unfortunately, but, but I think there are people who are, are working to understand these issues better and, and come up with solutions or, or ways to help. Yeah. Right. right. Um, next question. I've been finding myself reacting to this outbreak pretty uncharacteristically even though I get the flu shot every year and I'm fine with flu season and all that, 
for whatever reason, this outbreak uh, feels different to me. Can you give a few tips on how to calm myself down about the very uh, about the real anxiety caused by the outbreak, even if the anxiety isn't necessarily rational? Yeah, I think that's a great point. Mm. Um, and I mean, we we talked about how you know, flu is more familiar to us. And so I think the fact that COVID-19 is new does cause a lot of anxiety. And many of us know that that anxiety may not be fully rational, but we still feel it anyway. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think taking time for self-care and trying to limit your stress and, and trying to do things that just reduce stress and anxiety levels overall can help. Also unplugging and taking breaks from media, mm -hmm. from social media, from other media that kind of continues to perpetuate this fear can also help reduce anxiety levels. And just finding people to talk to can can also be really helpful to um, even just venting and talking about the anxiety you feel can can help yeah. reduce levels. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, working in healthcare, is there a suggestion on how to speak to others about potential risk spread without accidentally stigmatizing them? A lot of coworkers feel uncomfortable pre-screening patients due to the fear of seeming ignorant or intrusive. Um, yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, so I mean, I think for healthcare workers, it's important to stress to to patients um, that you know this is not a virus that you know disproportionately impacts people of a specific racial or ethnic group, but to take. Mm -hmm standard precautions like the CDC has outlined, you know, to cough inside uh, your elbow, don't touch your, your face or your hands. Um, and if someone is displaying symptoms and they, they meet the criteria for testing, then, you know, saying to them that, oh, it looks like you might have symptoms and you might meet these criteria, so we're recommending mm -hmm. uh, to test you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, assuming that we have the tests Assuming available that we have the tests by the end of this week. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I know they're ramping up production, yeah. Um, but uh, um, yeah, I mean, it works both ways, exactly. right? I, and people should be tested if they're at risk, but at the same mm -hmm. time, who's at risk and are we testing appropriately, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, since Columbia goes on spring break next week, I'm planning on flying home to Colorado to visit family. I'd love to see my grandmother, but she's 94, and I'm worried about causing her any harm. Would it be best for me to not come in contact with her? I mean, if you are having symptoms of anything, then I would say it would be best to postpone your trip. But most people are not infected with COVID-19 at mm -hmm. this point. And if you haven't had symptoms, and particularly if you're not in a, a group that's um, you know, prone more prone for infection, then you probably are okay to travel. Mm. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's, I mean, I think that question just demonstrates mm -hmm. how sensitized we are, yeah. right? Um, not only to picking it up, but maybe transmitting it to yeah. other people as well. Right? And I think for a lot of people, that's the bigger concern yeah. because even if I get COVID-19, I it may not impact me very much, but if I come in contact, yeah, with a, a grandmother or, or elderly relative mm. or friend, then it could really have a detrimental impact on them. So, I mean, I think if you think you've been exposed to the disease or possibly been exposed, then maybe um, make sure you don't have symptoms mm -hmm. first, or, or maybe consider postponing travel if you think you've been been exposed. Um, but if you haven't had any symptoms of illness and you don't think you've been exposed to COVID-19, then you're likely okay to travel. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Um, what is your prognosis for the next couple of months? How will people behave regarding stigma and panic? I unfortunately think people will continue to panic yeah. and we will unfortunately continue to see um, instances of stigma and discrimination, particularly against the Asian population mm -hmm. um, or people of Asian descent. Um, so, I mean, I would say if you are someone who's been experiencing a lot of stigma or discrimination, make sure to take some self-care, make sure to find support, mm -hmm. um, because it is hard to deal with this um, constant barrage from society. Right. Um, and so, uh, yeah, and, find and to ways call to take care of yourself. And call out discrimination. I mean, we all yeah. have concerns, and um, yeah, uh, the health of every person 
is is a matter of concern. So, yes. um, but uh, um, yeah, I, I I will have to sort of keep a close eye on on what the longer term impact looks like, right? And yeah. and it's not just in the moment, but um, sort of uh, attitudes and so on, and also just the 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 financial hit that yes. um, you know small businesses might mm -hmm. be. Uh, uh, incurring right as a, yeah. as a result of of this uh, situation. Yeah. Um, so um, we've got some more questions. I hope it's okay for me yeah. to <laughs> address them with you. Um, how do you interpret the government's numbers regarding the outbreak? Do you trust them? And I assume we're talking about the U.S. government. <laughs> um, I. I do trust the numbers that the CDC has reported. At the same time, we haven't been testing everyone, so there may be much, there may be higher cases yeah. um, than what's being reported simply because we, we haven't been testing people and also because symptoms among, um, you know, some people are mild and they may not necessarily know that they have right. COVID-19. Yeah, I, I thought I heard maybe this morning uh, that only they've only done about 8,000 tests in the United States um, for mm -hmm. COVID-19 and which yeah, um, and they're talking about needing millions. So what that's going to look like, yeah. uh, obviously, is going to shape our perception of this outbreak because, I mean, certainly there are fatalities, but we don't know relative to what number of people infected, mm -hmm. right? And until we have that number, we can't really judge the mortality rate, the lethality of this mm -hmm. virus vis-a-vis -vis other um, you know, infections and so on, like influenza or SARS and so on, um, or MERS for that matter, which from my understanding is still active, still yeah, out there, right? It's still active, yeah. but it, it's not easily transmissible from human to human. Mm -hmm. So even though the fatality rate for MERS is, is fairly high, yeah. um, transmission, human to human transmission is much more difficult. Yeah. Um, but yes, on the other hand, uh, if there are more cases of COVID-19, that means that the current fatality rate um, that they're estimating is Which, likely an overestimate, yeah. and so yeah. the, the fatality right. rate is, is likely to be less than mm. what's currently estimated. Well, we shall see. Yeah. Um, I've read that a runny nose is not a symptom of COVID-19. Can you confirm or deny this? I don't know. I'm not a medical doctor, right. but I've from the symptoms that I've heard and read, um, from the CDC website, it tends to be more coughing and fever. Mm -hmm. um, but I, you know, that's not to say that there's not someone with COVID-19 who, who doesn't also have a runny nose. I, I don't actually know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and the problem is that, I mean, you could have a runny nose for so many different exactly. reasons. Exactly, right? exactly. So, so I, if you have a runny nose, I would not presume that that's indicative of a sign that you have COVID-19, mm -hmm. but I, I'm not in a position to say that, mm. that that's not a symptom. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, um, we'll leave it at that. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, two related questions. Uh, can stigma actually make the crisis worse? Um, mm -hmm. We can sort of go into uh, more about stigma. People who feel stigmatized, uh, being afraid to seek treatment mm -hmm. and so on. And uh, what evidence from other epidemics is there that reducing stigma and discrimination reduces the epidemic? So I can talk about HIV because right. that's, yeah. um, you know, also now become a more chronic disease. So I think with some of these shorter epidemics like SARS and things like that, we, we don't really have evidence to tell about whether reducing stigma actually makes an impact on the epidemic. But for HIV, it certainly does. Mm. If there's a lot of stigma and discrimination, people won't access testing, they won't access healthcare yeah. services, um, they won't get on antiretroviral treatment, mm. which um, prevents uh, transmission of HIV. Mm. And, and then also helps them maintain their own health. And so reducing stigma and discrimination is very important for epidemics, at, at least especially for the HIV epidemic, mm -hmm. um, and has been a contributing factor in, in helping get people linked to care and reducing uh, transmission. And that's not to say that we've solved stigma and discrimination in HIV because those are still very real problems yeah. Yeah. that still continue to impede access um, to service and care, but but certainly trying to reduce stigma, stigma and discrimination is is very important for mm -hmm. epidemics. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, 
Next question. The government of Kazakhstan predicts that the first COVID case in the country is expected on March 16th to the 17th. How reliable can um, th this information be? Can can first outbreaks be statistically calculated? I, and then this is, yeah, because I know there are uh -huh. algorithms and sort of looking at um, how fast uh, you can expect yeah. epidemics. Is there, so from an epidemiology point of view? So I'm not sure where they got the exact date from. Um, I mean, I, I feel like that's an estimate, and I'm not sure where what variables they use to try and calculate that estimate. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think in Kazakhstan and other areas, I think it will be difficult to contain COVID-19. So the likelihood of other countries getting cases in the future is probably quite likely. Mm -hmm. um, but again, people aren't being tested. So, so it may be that some other countries also have these cases, yeah. um, but just haven't detected them yet because people may be asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic right. um, and just weren't tested. Well, to go back to uh, the accuracy of government numbers and so mm -hmm. on, I, wasn't there a representative from the CDC who said that, I mean, we're going to see things get pretty serious here in the United States and there's going to be uh, serious disruption in our lives um, with regard to, and, and I know maybe this is just speculation, but uh, a fairly high rate of, of, of infection uh, widespread through the United States. Yes. Yeah. So, I mean, human to human transmission of COVID-19 does seem to be quite mm -hmm. easy. So I, you know, I'm not going to go against the, the CDC no. official who is expert um, on the situation, I assume that we will see many more cases mm. in the U.S. Um, the extent of disruption to, there will probably be some disruption. I mean, we've already seen disruption to our daily lives here at Columbia with classes being changed and things. Right. Um, the extent of the disruption will probably depend on, on local governments and how particular organizations respond. Mm. Um, and, and it just kind of remains to be seen how many of these cases end up being very severe. Right, and, and the expectation is that the uh, majority of cases will be mild yes. and, and, and uh, manageable um, through healthcare. Uh, so we've got one final comment and one final question, if that's okay. As someone who works in healthcare, it's fascinating how my colleagues and I are coping well enough uh, with this, but we're watching the communities around us just emotionally fall apart. In Hawaii, our clinics and hospitals are almost out of supplies to handle basic airborne or droplet precaution. Um, that's what makes this riskier for everyone. So, um, yeah, yeah. I, I, you know, I, there are nurses associations so who are sounding the alarm and so on. And I mean, are we ready? That's, I mean, this is also a great point um, and a reason not to panic. So mm. the CDC does not recommend that general members of the public wear face masks, for example, because it hasn't been found to be effective mm. um, or particularly useful in preventing just a member of the general population from getting um, COVID-19. However, people who are sick with COVID-19 should be wearing face masks and healthcare workers need to be wearing face masks. Mm. So please do not stockpile face masks because we really need um, those medical supplies to be available for hospitals and healthcare facilities who need them to treat patients mm -hmm. um, and to protect healthcare workers themselves who are constantly in contact with, with patients who have, have this illness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, and finally, a follow-up question on the coping strategies for the Asian population on blame and hatred due to COVID-19. What should uh, they do on the site? How to react if they are stopped and verbally accused on a public location, on the subway? Thank you. Yeah, yeah that's a really difficult situation to deal with. And it also depends on kind of the situation. I would say first and foremost, prioritize your safety, confronting someone about it about their poor behavior on the subway may not necessarily be um, the safest option for mm. you, depending on how that individual might react. Um, but I think finding a supportive community and also if you're not a person of Asian descent, also supporting um, people of Asian descent and, and helping call out racist and discriminatory behavior when you see it um, and serving as a support system is, is very helpful. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Uh,
Dr. Davis, it's yes. wonderful Thank having you. you on our show today. Thank um, you for having me. And uh, that concludes today's episode. Next week, we'll be joined by CSSW senior research scientist uh, Vincent Chiraldi and Marcellus Morris to discuss their proposals for a smarter parole system in New York. So thanks again for joining us today for this special edition of Social Impact Live. Have a great rest of your week. See you all next week.